that form the universe, molding mountains just like clay, are the same hands working in men's hearts and changing lives today. Yes, the God who put the stars in flight and made pathways in the sea is the God who gives direction and gentle guidance now to me. Thou art worthy. And gave sight to blinded eyes Is the man who let himself be nailed On a rugged cross to die Yes, the Christ who left a borrowed tomb To reign eternally Is the Christ who brought redemption from my sin has made me free. Thou art worthy.
Can God redeem us in her, stumbling blindly all alone? Is there hope for all the lost ones who his mercy have not known? Is the ear of God still open to the cries of sinful man? Can God redeem a sinner? Yes, he can. God can, yes, he can. All power is in his hand. If we seek him, we will fight. He's always there, always there. His mercy is long-suffering. There is grace for every man. Can God redeem a sinner? Yes, he can. Can God revive a Christian who has wandered far away? When the fellowship is broken, there's no peace on Welcome you tonight, Temple Baptist Church. Good to see you in the house of the Lord on this Sunday night. Let's stand and ask God to bless our service together. And we are thankful that Jesus saves, Jesus saves. And we need to blow that trumpet everywhere we go. Loosen our tongue as we uh, spoke about this morning and tell everyone that Jesus saves. We welcome those joining us through the online. Appreciate you joining us through Facebook Live or YouTube. And let's pray and ask God to speak to our hearts. Father, we do love you. Thank you again for the privilege to be in the house of God on this Sunday night. Thank you that we still have the Sunday night service, and I pray that again tonight you would stir our, the embers of love in our hearts. I pray, Lord, that you would bless from this very opening song until the very last. Amen. We do thank you that you save, and Lord, if there's anyone tonight lost, I pray that they would put their faith in Jesus Christ and be saved tonight. I pray for those of us who are saved that you would help us to grow in our faith, and Lord, we come to a great text tonight. I pray that you would help Help us to walk in truth. I pray that our children, oh Lord, thank you for all the boys and girls and teenagers that are here tonight. What a thrill that is. And I pray that they would walk in truth as well. I pray that you would speak to our hearts. We pray Christ would be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Hymn number 194 there in your hymnal. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. And Brother David will lead us. Let's sing it out. 194. And we'll sing everything except verse 4. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought Since Jesus came into my heart I have light in my soul for which long I have sought Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Like the sea billows roll Since Jesus came into my heart I have ceased from my wandering and going astray Since Jesus came into my heart And my sins, which were many, are all washed away Since Jesus came into my heart Jesus came into my heart, and of dark clouds of doubt, now my pathway is 
singing. I hope that's how you feel about it. Floods of joy over my soul like the sea billows roll since Jesus came to my heart. I noticed it's interesting. Copyright there, 1914, over 100 years old. And man, it still speaks to our hearts tonight. The car is going to sing. Please allow the Lord to speak to you. Whosoever heareth shall shout the sound. Spread the blessed tidings all the world around. Tell the joyful news wherever man is found. Whosoever will may come. Amen. Whosoever will, whosoever will. Send the proclamation over vale and hill. Tis a loving Father calls the wanderer home. Whosoever will. Jesus is the true, the only living way, whosoever will may come, whosoever will, whosoever will, send the proclamation over bell and hill, tis the loving Father calls the wanderer home, whosoever will may come. is secure, whosoever will forever must endure, whosoever will, tis life forevermore, whosoever will may come, whosoever will, whosoever will, send the proclamation over vale and hill, tis a loving father, calls the wanderer home. Whosoever will may come. Amen. How many are glad we have a whosoever God that he invites whosoever will, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And we're thankful for that. Thank you, choir. They're going to come down and uh, let's all sing 327. I'm pressing on to higher ground. And let's stand. We'll sing it out as they join us. 327. Higher ground. I'm pressing on the upward way to heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I'm onward bound, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand, my faith on heaven's table. Doubts arise and fears dismay, though some may dwell where these abound. My prayer, my aim is higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand. My faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Or plant my feet on higher ground. I want to live. Satan's darts at me are hurled, for faith. 
singing. You may be seated. Let's sing another uh, chorus or two here uh, tonight. Of course, we are four weeks away from our revival, and so here's a good revival song. We haven't sung it for a little while. Number 47 there in your hymnal. It's a John o. Rice one. Let the sun shine. We'll just do the chorus. Let the sun shine again. Let the flowers bloom again. Stir the embers of love in my heart. Holy Spirit, reprove. Then embrace me again. Let the sun shine again in my heart. Now, 47, we'll just do the chorus. <clears throat> let the sun shine again. Let the flowers bloom again. Stir the embers of love in my heart. Holy Spirit, reprove. Then embrace me again. Let the sun shine again in my heart. Let's try it one more time. Ready? Let the sun shine again. Let the flowers bloom again. Stir the embers of love in my heart. Holy Spirit, we prove. Then embrace me again. Let the sun shine again in my heart. And let's try 276 there. Oh, let's do the first and last one. Where he leads me, I will follow. I'll go with him, with him all the way. You know, the missionaries say, where he leads me, I will follow. What he feeds me, I will swallow. And uh, sometimes you, I guess, uh, what was that one missionary said? Lord, I'll pray and thank you for it. And uh, I'll put it in there, but you got to get it down and you got to keep it down. And uh, anyways, let's sing where he leads me. 276 there. <clears throat> I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. Take thy cross and follow, follow me. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. I'll go with him, with all the way verse number four he will give me grace and glory he will give me grace and glory he will give me grace and glory and go with me with me all the way I will follow where he leads me I will follow where he leads me I will follow I'll go with him with him all the way and I hope we all mean that right Lord, wherever you lead me, I'll follow. I say this, Lord, uh, this prayer different times. Lord, I'll go wherever, do whatever, be whatever. Just you tell me what to do. And where he leads me, I will follow. 
Uh, kids choir uh, tonight, if you are uh, one of our children, four up through 11 years of age, kids choir practice in the room tonight, uh, just for a brief practice there um, in the uh, back tonight. And so you can follow Mrs. Cook there, all the kids four through 11. So glad to see so many of you boys and girls here tonight on Sunday night. And to thank you parents for having them here. I didn't get to say this morning that we're glad Bethany is back. And uh, she was in the back this morning. I didn't even know she was back there. And Stephanie said, Bethany and Asa, the baby were, uh, and Bethany were here. And so anyways, we say congratulations to them. And uh, so we're glad to have Asa here as a first time visitor here at Temple Baptist Church. And uh, we're glad that these guys are here. And each one of you, glad to see you tonight. Is there anyone that needs a bulletin? If you'll raise your hand and uh, we'll get one to you. All right, just hold it up there. Brother Eric will come by. Brother Mike will come with the announcements. And I'll come back with a couple other announcements here in a minute as well. All right, this Tuesday we have our seed line ministry at 1 o'clock and 6 o'clock. And so I invite you to come out for that. We had a great turnout this past Tuesday, getting together the Word of God. And so we'll meet again this Tuesday. Also have visitation ministry that Tuesday at 645, where we go out and visit those who visit us and just other visits here at the church. I know that's encouragement to those people. And so we'll go out at 645. And then Saturday at 10 a.m., we go out soul winning. I encourage you to come out there with us. Uh, it was Really, it felt really nice this past Saturday. One of the best Saturdays to go out with Soul Wind is every Saturday, but we got some good weather for this past one. And so anyway, I invite you to come out with us this Saturday at 10 a.m. Go out, we knock on doors, we tell people about the Lord, and we show them how to be saved. And so anyway, if you come out with us Saturday at 10 a.m., come on out. King's Kids is going to be starting back on August the 31st, and so we've been making preparations for that. And so if you want to get your kid involved with that, just show up August the 31st. Uh, this year, we're going to be going through the first five books of the Bible. And so, anyway, we're excited about that. Last year, we went through all of the epistles and uh, Romans there through Revelations and uh, Revelation. And so, anyway, we did that last year. And the kids, through the scope of the whole time they're in King's Kids, we go through the whole Bible. Obviously, we can't go through every single thing in the Bible. But we go through just a general Bible knowledge throughout the entire Word of God through their time there in King's Kids. And also, they memorize scripture, memorize doctrines. And so, I encourage you to get your kids involved with that. That is ages four years old all the way up through the sixth grade. And so, we've got shirts for them and books and uh, um, all that kind of stuff. We have a great time. So, anyway, that is August 31st on Wednesday nights. We'll be starting that back up. August the 20th, this Saturday at 5 o'clock, is our church picnic. And that is at the Oak Hill Community Park. And so, anyway, I invite you to come out there with us for that. We have a great time. Uh, if you want to bring any kind of games or, or equipment or anything like that, just please feel free to bring it. We're going to have a good time there. Uh, if you can bring a side item there and a drink, that will be wonderful. And we're going to meet there at 5. If you don't know where that is, just uh, let us know, and we can get you directions to that place. Uh, but it's a great, wonderful time that we have. And this next Sunday, we're going to be having a missionary Bob Green with us. And so I know he's been here in the past, but he is a great encouragement to our church. And so you don't want to miss that. He'll be here. Church work night is August the 26th. And so that is a Friday night there at 530. We're encouraging you to come spruce up the place as we get ready for revival and our youth rally and everything like that. We still have a few spots left on our 30 days of prayer. And so if you can help us out with that, there in the lobby is we have a sheet that you can go and sign up on a day. And what you're doing whenever you sign up is you're committing to pray for one hour on that day for our revival. And so we have a couple of days there. And if you look on there and all those are filled up, that's great. On, on the back of it or on, at the very end of those papers, you can put a date maybe that you can pray uh, for an hour a day. And that way, leading up to a revival, we have had 30 days of constant prayer leading up to it. And we want God to work in our revival, and so we need to ask Him to work on our revival. And so if you will, sign up for that there in the lobby. Also, be in prayer for our youth rally. So uh, what's going to be happening is September the 10th is a Saturday. We're going to have our youth rally going into our revival meetings. So September the 10th, we're going to have a youth rally. September 11th is when our revival starts. Please be in prayer for that. And teenagers, be already thinking in your mind, who can I invite to this youth rally? Because the whole purpose of this is to see people be encouraged in the Lord, but also to see people get saved. 
And so if you know of your lost friends, people that don't know Jesus Christ, people that aren't in church, even those that are in church, and invite them because it's going to be encouraging to them, but especially those who do not have a church, who do not know the Lord, invite them to come. Because uh, Pastor Michael Jones is going to be preaching for us on that day. He is a fantastic teen speaker, and he's going to be giving the gospel. And so I always say, a true friend tells other people about Christ. And so well, I've got some invitations. See me. You can give your friends one of those. Uh, it also, it is free bows on that day. And so anyway, you can talk to your friends say, hey, we're going to go down to bows that day as well. And that can be kind of like, oh, man, that's fun. But, man, we can give them the gospel. And so anyway, we want to do that September the 10th. I invite you to come out for that, if you will. Amen. Thank you, Brother Micah. Let me just... Uh... Um, expand on a couple of the announcements. Uh, one is, uh, again, going back to the work night, that'll be a week from uh, Friday, the 26th. And man, we love to have just a, a good army of people here to try to get the building and the property uh, looking nice for the glory of God inside and outside. And to just have, we, we have more to do than we have people to do it. So the more people we have, the more we can get done. Is that a best good way of saying it, Brother Dale? And uh, so he has a long list ready for us. Also this week, he, uh, he's going to get some mulch, and if you could help us even this week, depending on your time, uh, maybe some teenage boys, single uh, men, not that you aren't busy, but uh, you have strength, and, uh, or adult men as well, or ladies, but if you would have some time this week to help just uh, spread some mulch, if you will see Brother Dale, he is the very dignified man in the pink shirt. <laughs> would you raise your hand there? <laughs> That's Miss Phyllis, right? <laughs> but uh, if you'll see Brother Dale there, and uh, it, and that way, the reason being is we're we're trying to coordinate it. We don't know exactly what time the mulch will come, if we'll have it tomorrow or what day. So we're trying to coordinate that. But if you could help us, that would be a blessing. And uh, but please, if you could just put aside that Friday night, come with your family. We have a great time, and it'll just help us to uh, get God's house. Say, what's so important about that? Read First and Second Chronicles. <laughs> I mean, you want to talk about God's house deserves to be, and I, I realize the temple is not the same as the local church property. I get that. But the principle is there that we, we should do our best. Uh, we, try to, we try to be good stewards and take care and make our houses look nice. How much better? That's Haggai as well. How much better should God's house be? So that's one. Second thing is this. On our 80th uh, year anniversary, we have a lot of things, and I'm, I'm excited. Um, we have a, these pictures. We're going to have uh, a big collage of them with an 80 and pictures in that 8-0. That'll be in the foyer area. Um, our revival course, September 11th through 14th, we're going to have a video, and we're going to have a timeline of the 80 years. And we have some pictures. I'll be honest with you. Um, I've not ever seen a picture of any other pastor, uh, really, other than Pastor Broyhill, as far as anyone before that. But we have pictures of other pastors uh, that were here before that. Even, I believe, a picture of our first pastor. Okay, uh, Pastor Pruitt. And anyways, it's just going to be great. And we're going to have testimonies during the revival and uh, have some ones in. And it, it, we're just looking forward to a lot of things there. Now, on the other side of the coin of that, I have a mission that, that is on my heart that I want to do for the 80th anniversary. And it's going to take still a little time to do this, but our church constitution is in desperate need of just being edited, revised, and really um, updated. And so I've been working on that. It, it's not fun work, but it's a lot of work. And I've been, Pastor Dietrich gave me their CLA. We've been trying to get constitutions and bylaws. Um, man, I mean, I, I'm on 20 some pages already of what I've done, putting together our statement of faith and then the bylaws, how we carry on the church polity. So what we will do is that, so I want to do it for our 80th anniversary. For instance, I think we need to have in there in our church constitution that we're not going to change the name of our church from being a Baptist church. That's just one example of things that, so that 80 years from now, now I believe the Lord's going to come, but if he does not, 80 years from now, I want our church to have the same statement of faith and bylaws. There are a lot of things with um, just litigation, obviously the things that have taken place with the transgenderism, um, homosexual marriages, all these things that we need to have our bylaws in place as far as legally. So that's why 
it's a lot of work. It's a lot of wearing out the brain. But I just am determined in our 80th year, it, we just need to do that. So if you'll pray for that, number one. Number two, obviously, we'll go by our Constitution right now on the amendments to our new Constitution. Meaning by that, we will give all that to you. You'll have a couple weeks to look over that, and then there will be a vote. That, that whole thing will be a process. And, uh, but I just want to make you aware of that. Obviously, we're not changing anything. All, all we're going to do is we're going to strengthen it to make it uh, more dedicated to the Lord and to the Word of God and just on the legal side. And so if you'll pray for that. The third thing is this. Um, we have our church picnic on Saturday. I always say this the Sunday and Wednesday before the church picnic. And so if some of you are like, uh, well, I, I'm the pastor and I stand before the Lord for this. This is a church picnic. Now, I understand we will probably have someone that will come to the church picnic that will not follow our dress standards. I don't want you to go to them. I don't want you to look them in the eye and say, hey, you're out of here. You know, we don't do that. I'm talking to our Sunday night crowd, though. We are members of our church. We are the backbone of our church. We have consistently for 80 years, when we have church events, tried to maintain church dress standards. I'm not going to police what you do in your house. I hope you'll maintain standards of modesty and decency there. You should. But as a husband, you're in charge of your home. But as a church, it is very important. You say, preacher, no church does that in these days. I realize not many do, but there are some that still do. But whether they do or not, we are an independent autonomous church. It's what is right. And so we ask our ladies for our church picnic, please wear a skirt, culottes, something that are, is along the line of our church standards. And we ask the same for our guys. And so please help us with that. Um, and we review that every single year. And so please help us with that. Again, if someone comes, no, did I say about guys wearing culottes and skirts? <laughs> I saw a lot of people talking, you know. <laughs> oh, man. Um, Mena, is she in the nursery? Mena is in the nursery tonight, and she, she texted me. You know, she gave a testimony a couple weeks ago, and I, how many thought that was just an amazing testimony she gave? She texted me. I said, I am so sorry. I messed up that whole testimony. I said, well, Mena, I didn't see it. And she said something, well, she said something didn't come out the way I wanted it to come out. I said, welcome to my world, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. And right there, right? Now, guys, wear your sweatpants, blue jeans, whatever. And girls, if you, uh, ladies, if you can help us with uh, skirts and culottes. Listen, I, I, that's good that we had a tease on that. But let me be serious for a minute. This is important to me because we've got to maintain it. If we don't, Five years from now, we're going to have a church activity, and it doesn't even look like a church activity. And so, listen to me. Everyone draws the line somewhere. No, I don't. Well, yeah, you do, because you didn't come in here stark naked. I'm not being crude. But we all draw the line somewhere. Outback says no rules. Well, actually, they do have rules. If I go in there and order a steak and don't pay, they're going to call the police. Everyone has rules or standards. We draw them somewhere. Well, as a church, we want to draw them in, in a way. Now, again, don't go on the other side of the coin and someone shows up and, hey, you rotten sinner. No, we want to help people where they are. But I'm saying for our church, our, our Sunday night crowd, let's set the example. Does that make sense? Let's do our best, all right? Prayer request. Man, so glad the goers are here. Want to continue to pray for Miss Diane, Miss Darla May. Uh, Miss Becky McNeely, please pray for her and uh, Nahum. We want to pray for the Northrops at this time of bereavement. Uh, the Earps have a, a, a bereaving family. Mrs. Uh, Miss Trish's aunt passed away, and so we want to pray for both of these families at this time of bereavement. And uh, let's pray that God would speak to our hearts in a minute as uh, we open up the Word of God. Let me have Brother John Richardson, if you'll come and lead us in prayer tonight and uh, asking God to speak to our hearts as well through His precious and holy Word. Thank you so much, Father, for uh, hearing our prayer. And thank you, Father, for our church. We can still come and pray and, and be heard, and we can do this freely, Father. And we just thank you for that, and thank you for America, Father. I just pray for this country. And just pray, God, for our president, and I pray for our vice president, and all the senators and the congressmen and congresswomen. I pray, God, for them to be convicted, God, to 
to uh, do what is right, Lord, and just to live by your morals, by, by, your, by your standard that, that they know. And um, I just pray, Father, that you would just uh, have, a, have an impact upon uh, revival in this country. I pray for a spiritual, spiritual revival and, uh, in this nation. And uh, just pray, God, that you would just uh, do a mighty work here. Father, we thank you so much, Father, for uh, the pastor here. We thank you, Father, for all that he does for us, and just uh, we pray for his family, pray for uh, the guidance that, uh, that he provides and through you, and um, just pray for him, Father, and for his uh, just continued, uh, continued health and, uh, and, um, and present, presence here as our pastor. Father, just pray, Lord, for those who are sick, and pray, Father, for, uh, thank you, Father, for bringing um, goers back and thank you father for that and just continue to pray for her please and uh thank you father for her uh her, her husband for randy for his uh for his commitment to his wife and um it just it's it's refreshing father to see that and um it's important for that for them to come and, and just be with us and pray father for uh miss becky and just help her father with her her uh her difficulties and just be with her father please to, to strengthen her god to bring her back and Help her father in every way. Pray for Nahum and Todd and, uh, and the family, Father. And uh, thank you, Father, for all that you do for them. And thank you, Father, for, uh, for the, the, uh, the camp that they had this, this past month and, and for the kids and, and uh, for, for all that occurred there. And I just pray, God, for, uh, for one of the teens, God, for, for one or more of the teens to make a commitment to preach or to become, or to, or to become missionaries, Father. I just pray that you just do a mighty work with them. And Father, there's so much more here on the list. God, we can just pray for all the folks. And um, we love you. We need you. We pray for the pastor tonight, helping God with his message. And uh, just do a mighty work. Help us, God, to be receptive to that message. And ask us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We do believe God hears and answers prayer. Let me say one more thing going back to the picnic uh, church. I know I keep saying this. We'll have the hot dogs and hamburgers and rolls and all that. Brother Terry's got a big old grill, right? And uh, he's going to be grilling and uh, it's going to be, man, we're going to have a great night. Uh, and we have both pavilions. But if you'll bring a bag of chips or dessert, side item, something like that and drink, uh, that would be great. And we'll plan to eat about 530. Let me encourage you with your offerings. Man, I tell you, God's been so good to us and uh, just amazed with tithes and offerings and just the faithfulness all through the summer. And uh, we just had our best giving year and summer that we've ever had. And we just give God the glory for it. But let's not let up. Let's be faithful with our tithes and offerings. If you get your Bible ready, we'll be in 3 John tonight and uh, looking at this, uh, the first few verses. I really, this sermon's burning in my heart. I think you'll understand why by the end of the sermon. And so please listen. And we'll be in 3 John uh, after the offertory. Miss Jenny's going to play.
so much, Miss Jenny. Third John in your Bible went through First John, Second John. Now we come to Third John, another short book here in the Word of God. If you're physically able, let's stand for the reading of God's Word. Third John. We'll read the first five verses tonight. Third John, beginning with verse one. The elder unto the well beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth, beloved. I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Beloved, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers." So I circled in my Bible these words in verse 1, the word well-beloved, Gaius, but well-beloved. In verse 2, again, he calls him beloved. In verse 5, he calls him beloved the third time. And so I've entitled the message tonight, The Beloved Brother. You can really break down 3 John. Someone said it's a tale of three men, and we'll look at them. You have Gaius, and then you're going to get into Diotrephes, and then you're going to get into Demetrius. So there's three, there are three different men, and we'll look at Gaius tonight, the beloved brother. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you. Thank you for the word of God. Oh, Lord, cleanse my heart. Forgive me of every sin. Help me right now to be filled with thy spirit. Lord, speak to us. Father, especially verse 4, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Father, I pray that you'd burn that verse down deep in our souls. And help us to see it experienced in our lives, in our church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. Well, a little unknown fact about my wife. I just made her very nervous, didn't I? <laughs> no, my wife has collected postcards throughout her life. Um, I know that sounds a little old-fashioned probably to young people today, but when her parents or grandparents would go on a trip, they would always uh, send a postcard back. And you know, that was a tradition. And boy, she has a binder of postcards really from places around America and either, even other places around the world. She has a whole notebook of those uh, postcards. I say that to say this, that 2 John and 3 John are like postcards. They're very, very short books in the Bible, but I want to say two statements about that. Here's number one. We should never underestimate the importance of these two books simply because they are brief. And here's my second statement. The Holy Spirit does not always inspire a long book in order to convey an important message. Let me say that again. The Holy Spirit does not always inspire a long book to convey an important message. I think sometimes we got to be careful with the minor prophets with that. Uh, you know, you have the minor prophets there, Joel and Amos and Obadiah and Jonah and all the rest, 12 of them. And sometimes we think, oh, they're minor prophets. And then you have the major prophets, Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel. And, and we say this often. They're not minor because they are less important or they're less inspired. They're just shorter. So that's why we call them minor compared to major. But let me say to you, all scripture is given by inspiration inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 say. So these two books of the Bible, though they are very brief, they are the inspired, infallible word of God. Now, there are some differences between 2 John and 3 John. 2 John was written to a lady. We studied about that. He wrote it to this elect lady. 3 John is written to a man, to Gaius, as he addresses him in verse 1. 2 John is warning us against deceivers. And remember we talked about that last week and, and the week before about not letting them into your house and warning about deceivers. Really, 3 John is warning about a dictator, a man by the name of Di uh, Diotrephes, who rose up in that church and had some kind of papal power. And we'll look at him when we get to him more. This book, 3 John, and this is just kind of introductory statements to get us ready for the book, but this book introduces us to some people and some problems. And could I say to us, church, that wherever you have people, you're going to have problems. There's no church that does not have problems because every church has people. And God is blessed and added to our church, and I praise God for that. But the more people you add to the church, the more potential problems you're going to have. Because you have more interpersonal relationships going on. And so, 
Well, what do we do? Well, then it's our four and no more. We don't add to church. No, that's not the answer. The answer is that we want to all walk in the Spirit and be filled with the Spirit of God so that we're unified as a body of Jesus Christ. Let me say this. I want all of us to ask ourselves this question, thinking about that. Am I part of the problem or am I part of the solution? Am I part of the problem in a church? Boy, I went when I was 11 years of age, and really it started about when I was 10, and, and then finally it came to a vote when I was 11. We went through a, I went through a terrible church split when I was a boy, and boy, experienced that, and the hatred, and the divisive, uh, divisiveness, and the strife, and uh, clamoring, and it was just awful. And I don't want to ever be a part of the problem. I want to be a part of the solution. I want to... Only by pride cometh contention, but with the well-advised well is wisdom, the Bible says. Proverbs 13 and verse 10. And so this book, you got, you got a guy who's really a part of the solution, Gaius, and then you have a guy that's part of the problem, Diotrephes, because of pride. And I, we don't want to be that. And we'll get to him in further weeks. Other weeks, I should say. This epistle was written by John. We find that in verse 1. The elder unto the well-beloved. Remember, he identified himself the same way in 2 John as the elder. Why does he say he's the elder? He's the last of the living of the apostles. He, he's in his 90s, we think. He's very uh, an elderly man, especially in that day. And he's writing this epistle to this man by the name of Gaius. We find his name in verse number 1. Some people think he was a pastor in a church. Other people think he was just a prominent, faithful member in the church. I don't know what is the case, but we know that there are several Gaiuses in the Bible. and We're not sure if he's one of those or just another Gaius. Gaius, I found by reading this, was the most common name in the Roman day that they lived in. And so whatever you think of as a very common name, like we have three or four Johns in our church, it was like that. It's a very common name. And so Gaius, we do know this, that John loved him. He calls him the well-beloved. He calls him twice beloved Gaius, the beloved. And have you found this out? Some people are easy love. And we'll just leave it at that, right? Gaius was one of those guys. I mean, you just had to love him. He, he's just easy to love. And I, I, I think all of us want to be that kind of guy, the beloved Gaius. And so let's look at Gaius here tonight, and we'll look at these other men in, in uh, succeeding weeks. But I want to give you tonight three characteristics about Gaius, the beloved brother. Three characteristics about this man Gaius. I call him the beloved brother. Would you write them down? Here's the first characteristic. Number one, he was a healthy believer. Number one, he was a healthy believer. Again, verse number one of 3 John. The elder, that would be John, unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. And then he says in verse two, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health. And here's the phrase I love. Would you underline it? Even as thy soul prospereth. He's a healthy believer. Bodily, physically, he was a sick man. But boy, his soul was prospering. And I'll say more about this in a second. But if I had to pick one or the other, I would want my soul to be healthy much more than my body. Although it's great when both are healthy. And John said, I, I wished above all things, I'm praying for you, brother, that you would be in good health physically, even as you are soul prospering, even as you are spiritually healthy. Now, I've got to debunk something here because the health and wealth prosperity gospel preachers of our day, they love to use this verse. It's one of their key verses. And so let me say a few things about this. In the Old Testament, one's spiritual prosperity could be measured by one's material prosperity. We see that with Moses and, I'm sorry, uh, Abraham and Job. Uh, Abraham, really, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Job, the patriarchs. We see that in those days. But the New Testament blessing is quite different. So let me make this statement. God makes no guarantee that you will be healthy and wealthy if you obey him and walk in his ways. He makes no guarantee of that in our day. The Apostle Paul, how many would agree with me that he was a very spiritual man? He wasn't healthy or wealthy. Now, if riches increase, praise God, but set not your heart upon them. If God blesses you with good health, thank God for that. I, I've been healthy. Someone asked me the other day. Uh, they were asking me for recommendations. said, Preacher, who's your doctor? I don't have one. I, I know I should, but 
I never have to go to the doctor. I've been healthy. Now, that could change tomorrow. I understand. But I thank God for good health. You have good health. Praise the Lord for it. If you're wealthy, praise God for it and tithe. <laughs> but I'm just saying God doesn't promise you that. We see that all through the New Testament. Um, John, he lived and you say, well, look at how old he was. But yeah, he went to the Isle of Patmos and they burned him in hot oil. But all the other ones, they didn't live long lives. They lived very short lives as far as what we would think about the duration of a life. And so this verse does not promise or promote the gospel of prosperity. In fact, Jesus Christ, he said, he said, foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man hath nowhere to lay his head. Now, again, if God blesses you with that, praise the Lord for it. I'm just saying, if you have this mentality that if I'm in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and I read my Bible, I'm going to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. That is not New Testament Christianity. God may bless you with that, but that's not a guarantee. In fact, the health and wealth gospel, prosperity gospel people, they, they use this verse, but if you actually read it, they're completely misinterpreting the verse. Because it says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. The indication here is this, that Gaius was not in good health. And so he's saying, I wish, that word wish literally means pray. I am wishing, I'm praying for you, brother, that you would be healthy physically as you are with your soul, because your soul is prospering, your soul is healthy. And I, so I want to say again, it is possible to be spiritually healthy and physically sick. And so let's make the application this way. Is your soul as healthy as your body? I think we should be concerned about our physical health. I try to exercise because, you know, as pastor, it's not a very physical work. Mentally, spiritually, uh, mentally, uh, emotionally, and uh, mentally, yes, but not physically. And so I try to run and exercise. Some. I think we should take care of the physical body that God has given to us, physical health. I think we should take care and be good stewards of our body. The Bible tells us that in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. These bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost. So I think we should. I'm just saying this, but we should be more concerned about our spiritual health than our physical health. And if we took as much care for our soul as we do for our body, man, can you imagine how spiritually healthy our church would be? Physical health is a result of nutrition exercise and proper rest and maybe genes and some other things but nutrition exercise rest those are three ingredients and could I say spiritual health is the same way Gaius had those they are a result of nourishment and and exercise and proper rest and so let me make the application I think we should nourish our souls on the word of God just like we would eat three times a day oh may God help us to be in the word of God day and night and feed our souls on the word of God I wonder if you put as much emphasis in your spiritual nutrition as you do physically in your, uh, your physical nutrition man how healthy could we be spiritually for God by the way that's why we need a steady word a diet of the word of God that's why I'm always saying be in Sunday school be in Sunday school have your children have your family in Sunday school well I don't need to be in Sunday school I know it all well that might be a problem we all can learn something and so get in there learn the word of God well, I, don't, I don't agree with the teacher on everything I don't agree with myself on everything but I'm going to go in there and learn the word of God. And, and that's why I encourage you to be in church Sunday morning and Sunday night, Wednesday night. Why? Because I want my soul to be healthy. That's nutrition. But if you're banking on Sunday school or Sunday morning or Sunday night or Wednesday night being enough nutrition spiritually for your, for your soul, you're wrong. That's why every day and every night we've got to be in the word of God. Why? Because that's how our soul prospers. And so a physical body, it needs nutrition and a spiritual body needs nutrition. I, I've got to be in the word of God every day. I hope you don't bank on Pastor Bixler just feeding me. It is my job to feed you, but boy, you've got to feed on the word of God and feast on the word of God every day. And then we need exercise. That's a bad word, isn't it? <laughs> exercise. But physically we need to exercise, but boy, spiritually. The Bible says we exercise ourselves unto godliness. 
So we read the word of God, but we don't want to just be a fat cat. We want to put it into action. God didn't sit, save us to sit. God saved us to serve. And in some capacity, all of us can serve and exercise and use our spiritual gifts for the Lord. And then I said, physically, you need nutrition, exercise and rest. And boy, we need to rest our souls in the Lord Jesus Christ every day and rest in the goodness of God. Isaiah 40. I'm just saying that's how Gaius was. Number one, he was a healthy believer, spiritually. Number two, the beloved brother. Number one, he was a healthy believer. Would you write this down? Here's the second characteristic. Number two, he was a holy believer. He was a holy believer. Look at verse three. John says, for I rejoiced. And he doesn't put a comma there. He says greatly. It's a superlative ver, uh, word. I'm re Man, my heart is just over thrilled, overjoyed and thrilled with this. What? When the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. We'll get to verse 4 in a minute. That's the verse I can't wait to get to. But John said, man, the brethren, they came to me and they told me about you. And they said, Gaius is walking in the truth. And Gaius, he, they're testifying about you, Gaius, and how holy, how godly, how, how much you walked with the Lord, how you walked. What a wonderful testimony that is. Could I let you in on an inside secret with a pastor? One of the questions that scares me the most outside of these walls. I'm in a restaurant and someone comes up to me and I'm talking to them. Hey, yeah, yeah. And they say, is so-and-so a member of your church? If it's a faithful, godly member, I'm like, yes, they are. Praise the Lord. There are a few. <laughs> I'm like, uh, I don't know what I want to say here. I'm not saying that judgmentally, but remember everyone that joins our church, I always say you're identifying yourself with the Lord, but also this church. And the only thing some people know about this church is what they know about a member of our church. And I remember years ago in Pennsylvania, I'll use that as an example, but uh, I was knocking on door and this guy said, Emmanuel Baptist Church. Doesn't so-and-so go to that church? And I said, oh, yeah, he does. And they said, man, he is the most foul-mouthed guy at our, at our uh, workshop. Well, that door closed real fast with witnessing. Gaius wasn't that guy. Is that what verse 3 says? I mean, he's the opposite. Gaius is the kind of guy that, and I don't know, again, if he's a, a member of the church or the pastor. We really don't know, and you can debate it, I guess, and dispute it. But Gaius is the kind of guy, if someone said, hey, doesn't that guy named Gaius go to your church? You're like, yeah, he does. And man, isn't he a wonderful blessing? That should be all of us. That should be our desire. And then verse 4 says this. Would you underline the whole verse? I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. No greater joy. I circle those words. It's the title of my series here on 3 John. No greater joy. That word my is an interesting word. I won't go into the Greek and bore you with it, but it's an emphatic word. And it can be rendered my own children. So it is evident that John led Gaius to Jesus Christ. I want to tell you, and every soul winner would say this, is it not a great joy to lead someone to the Lord Jesus Christ? Amen? But John says here, I have no greater joy that I led you to Christ. That's not what he said. He said, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children, referring to Gaius, he heard from the brethren, I have no great joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. I want to say to you, it is a great joy when you lead someone to Christ. It is an even greater joy when that convert walks in truth. The idea of the word walk there is a continual walk. It means they are continuing. It's a pattern of their life. They are continually walking in truth. And so I'm going to be very transparent and just share my heart to you because I love this verse. I have no, as a pastor of Temple Baptist Church, I have no greater joy than when you all walk in truth. No greater joy. My wife can testify to that. Joel, what do you want for Christmas? I'm not trying to be too humble. I, she, said, she said to me a couple months ago, they want to do something nice for the anniversary. They want to know what do you want. Can you fill out a list? I said, I don't know what I want. I'm thankful for anything, but I tell you what I want. I want God's people just to live right. 
I believe I'm telling the truth on this. That if someone gave me $1,000, that would not bring as much joy to my heart as seeing Daniel join the choir. And not that that outward is everything, but I'm just saying, when I hear or see God's people doing right and living right, there's no greater joy comes to my life. Wait a second, conversely, I have no greater sorrow than when I hear or see that people are not walking in truth. No greater sorrow. I've been in full-time ministry for 22 years since I graduated Bible college. I've been the pastor of this church uh, for 15 years. And it brings me great joy to lead people to Christ. I mean, I look out across this congregation and I just see... I, my mind goes to stories. I remember Brother Northrup, 72 years of age, and in his backyard at his garden, we bowed and he called upon the Lord and asked the Lord to save him. I mean, I, I just think about his humility. At 72 years of age, he asked a guy who was probably at that time barely 30 years of age, well, what do I need to do to be saved? I love that humility. And man, he, he said, I think I, I don't know when I was a kid. I said, well, let's get it settled. And then he allowed me to baptize him. What a great joy that was. So I look out here, man, I, I think about people I led to Christ or people that got saved here. Kayla, I always refer to that Christmas, the Sunday after Christmas, and I was at rock bottom. I was really having a hard time. I was discouraged and weary and well-doing. And I called my dad that morning and said, please pray for me because I don't even want to go preach this morning. I, I was struggling. And I preached that morning, and this shows you that it's not in the preacher at all. It's in the power of God because I preached that morning that morning and Caleb Pope walked the aisle and got saved and I, I could just go through stories like that I have no greater joy but I tell you what brings even more greater joy to my life is not that David Northrop got saved but for all these years later he's here Sunday morning Sunday night and Wednesday night he's walking in truth man that is great joy I, again I you can't give me enough money to, to, to compare to that. I have no greater joy. Man, when I finished Bible college, I worked in my home church uh, there in Pennsylvania for seven years. And I go back there, obviously, to visit family. And, man, it brings great joy to my heart and life when I go back there and I see people that I, I led to Christ and they're still in church or I taught, I, dis, I discipled them. One of the greatest joys in my life was last summer. I taught an evening school of the Bible and taught lay people the Word of God for years on Monday nights. Gave my Monday nights for years to do that. And we had a young man that went through that Bible. It was a little Bible institute. And I had a young man that went through that. And last summer, when I was at my home church, he taught the adult Sunday school class. And man, I'll tell you, he did a phenomenal job. And I just sat there. Steph and I, she knew, man. I, I remember that rascal when he was just a teeny bopper. And now he's standing up and he's teaching the Word of God. I mean, he did one of the, the most powerful lessons I've ever heard on the Word of God itself. It was unbelievable. Man, I tell you, there's no greater joy than that. I've been privileged to pastor this church now for 15 years, and it brings me great joy uh, to think about, again, leading so many of you to the Lord, baptizing so many of you today, Devin, what a privilege that was. I wonder, just by show of hands, just, this just encouraged me, how many of you I have had the privilege to baptize you? Would you raise your hand? A lot of you, you know? And man, what a joy that is. I've officiated so many of your weddings. I haven't done any of your funerals yet. <laughs> Some of you will get that a little way. Yeah, all God's people said, amen, right? <laughs> Some of you, many of you have been here my whole pastorate. I have no greater joy than seeing some of you get saved, baptized. But I tell you, what brings, I love leading someone to Christ, but what brings even greater joy to me as a pastor is when I see people just growing in the Lord and walking in truth and continuing 
Nothing. I, I, I mean, there's just nothing that brings greater joy to my heart. Every Sunday I get the financial report. And if you're a pastor, you look at that financial report because you want the bills to be paid. And man, we've had some great offerings through the years. And I'd be like, man, I go home and tell Stephanie, wow, man, praise the Lord for this. And especially in the early four or five years, uh, Brother Billy and I, we, we'd have to have enough offering just to pay the bills. And it was tough. And man, I just remember one day, a dear lady, she was here this morning. One of our senior saints doesn't get out as much at night, but she called me up and said, Hey, preacher, I have $1,684 to give to the church. And I was like, Oh, thank you, Jesus. We needed it. And God was just so faithful and so good. I'm just saying, but that doesn't bring as much joy as just seeing people walk in truth. John had a pastor's heart. Young people, how many of you are, let's say, 21 and, 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 and below? Would you raise your hand? It's a lot of you, and I'm glad you're here. Some of you don't know you're under 21. Okay. <laughs> One, two, three, four. School is starting. Hallelujah. Man, I think about some of our young people that grew up here, like Wednesday night. Man, we had an awesome service Wednesday night. But Wednesday night, Dakota and Kelsey were here. And I'll use her because she's not here. When I look back and I see Kelsey, and I think about the first night we moved here on a Thursday night, July 12th, I think it was, 2007. And you all were helping us unload in the, in the get in the house. And there was a, a little girl that was like seven years of age that wrote a note to Melanie and said, my name is Kelsey, and, and they actually share the same birthday. And to watch that little girl grow up and now serve God, you don't know what that does to my heart. And you don't have to be a pastor's wife or preacher's wife to do that. I mean, I look at people like, that are in here that I've watched grow up, and, and you're serving the Lord in our local church. Nothing brings greater joy to my life. I think about our Ambassador Baptist College students. Man, so many of them are walking in truth. And it's just really encouraging to me. Um, my brother-in-law, Tommy Dallas, and Kenny Dallas were the first two that we have. But we actually had Jeremy Lockhart, who's our missionary, before that. And man, Brother Lockhart's just serving God faithfully. Tommy called me the other day and said, Joel, you won't believe what God's doing in our church and was giving me an update of what God's doing there at their church. And he said, I'm just so thankful for Temple Baptist Church. I, I wouldn't be where I'm at without that church in my life. And Hunter serving God, I was texting with him this week up there in Brooklyn. And I don't know about Morgan, but um, I don't know about Micah, but no. Ryan DeLay's coming back here. I can't wait to see Brother Ryan again. He was preaching in his church today. Man, I'm telling you, no greater joy. It means more to me than anything else in the world. It really does. Outside of my family. Young people, I want you to hear me. People that grew up in this church that are now out of church. And I'm not saying that, y'all know, I am not saying that in an ugly way at all. I'm saying that in a caring pastoral way. I see Andrea, I want to hug her and say, praise the Lord, she's serving the Lord. But then my mind will go to someone else, not that one's better than the other per se, but someone else that sat on these pews. I took them to camp. I had them in Bible school. We served together. We worshiped together. And they're out of church. You say, preacher, you're putting a guilt trip. If it takes that, I'll do that. But you that are under 21, if you get out of church, listen, you're going to break my heart. You're going to break my heart. That office over there has been filled with a lot of, Lord, thank you for these people serving the Lord. And it's also been filled with a lot of tears.
old Adrian Rogers, he was a Southern Baptist, I'm an Independent Baptist, and I didn't, no one agrees with everything on everything, but I remember one time he got up, he had a son he, that was older, that, that had gotten away from the Lord. And in an SBC meeting, Adrian Rogers stood up and he said, I told my son, why don't you put a dagger in my heart? It would be a lot quicker than the pain you're bringing me by not doing what God says to do with your life. And I think every parent who has a prodigal feels the same way about that. And I know as a pastor, man, it just rips your heart out. And so... Young people and adults. I'm not just saying the young people, but adults. Before you get away from God, before you commit immorality, before a thousand other things that Satan uses. Just remember, it brings great joy to this pastor when you walk in truth. And it brings great sorrow. But how much more does it hurt the heart of God? Grieve the Spirit of God. Let's apply it this way. I was talking about a pastor, but let's apply it this way. Melanie, Alyssa, and Andrew, as a parent, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. And I'll tell you, and I'll say this publicly, Alyssa, Andrew, man, if your dad's walking, in, I mean, if you're walking in truth, you're going to thrill dad and mom's heart. If you get out of church and away from God, you're going to break my heart. You're going to break my heart and mom too. I'm saying tonight, parents, your greatest joy should be that your children walk in truth. Now buckle in. I'm going to be specific. I've learned that so many parents get more excited when their kid hits a home run than when their kid gets saved and baptized. That's wrong. I have no greater joy. Nothing should thrill your heart. Man, I tell you, if your boy hits a home run, that's a good time for a dad. Darren and I, we've had some good moments with our boys hitting, uh, getting hits and pitching games and all that. And I'm not minimizing that. I'm just saying this. But that can't compare to your child getting saved or your child obeying the Lord in baptism. You say, well, my child got first place, got all A's or whatever. Great. That's wonderful. But that shouldn't throw your heart more than watching your child read a Bible or pray or live for God. I'm just saying there should be nothing that brings more joy to your life than for your children to walk in truth. Many parents get more thrilled when their child lands a high paying job than when their child surrenders to be a preacher or missionary. Amen. I'm saying we're wrong on that. We've developed a worldly mentality. And that's why our young people aren't going in the ministry like they used to. I watched an 89-year-old man, Dr. Don Sisk, one of my heroes in the faith, served in Japan for years and had been in missions for whatever now, 70 years. And I, in June in our BIMI meeting, I watched him and he said, we have more missions money coming in than ever before. Our churches are giving more to missions than ever before, but we have fewer missionaries than ever before. And he said it's because parents map out what they want for their kids instead of letting God choose. And that's wrong. And if God calls your child to go to college and get a high paying job, hallelujah, I hope he stays in our church and ties and gives. I'm just saying, but don't talk your kids out of serving the Lord. Young person, I'll be happy if you get an academic scholarship or uh, if you get a, a good paying job or something like that. You have a successful career. Man, I'll be like, hey, good job. But I'll tell you what I want to hear more. Are you still in church and are you still living for God? Because that's, preacher, I was top in my class. I got a, I was going to say a 1600 on the ACT. I think you can get more than that now. I don't know what you ever. I got a high grade on my SAT score. I got an academic scholarship to Duke University. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever else. I'm going to pat you on the back and say, great. But my bigger concern is, are you still in church? Are you living for God? Are you walking in truth? That's the great joy. I need to move on. 
that verse, every parent, I think, should memorize it and pray for that. Certainly every pastor. All right, number one, Gaius, the beloved brother. He was a healthy believer spiritually. Number two, he was a, he was a holy believer. He's walking in truth. That's holiness. Number three, third characteristic, he was a hospitable believer. He was a hospitable believer. Look at verse five. Beloved, he addresses him again there. Thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers. And he goes on in 6 through 8 talking about how charitable he was, not just to the brethren, but also to strangers. And John commended him for his hospitality. He had a reputation of being hospitable and friendly to brethren and to strangers. He showed the love of Jesus Christ to those he knew well and to those he did not know or maybe had never met before. And I think that's so important. And let's just be honest. We all could improve in the area of hospitality. Brethren, strangers. Would you underline the word brethren and would you underline the word strangers? Because at our church, we have brethren here. We have saved people here. We have church members here. And we need to shake their hands and be warm and friendly to them and hospitable to them. But what about the strangers? And if we're not careful, we will kind of get in a little click. And I don't think we have clicks in our church. But I mean, as far as I know, Brother Green, it's a lot easier for me to talk to him than a visitor. But, man, I want to show the love of Jesus Christ to the brethren, but also to strangers. And if a stranger, a visitor, and by the way, every visitor is our honor guest here at Temple Baptist Church. But if, every, if a visitor uh, comes to our church and sits in your pew, thank God he's in your pew, and show him the love of Jesus Christ. That's what Gaius did. Hospitality. Hospitality is not inviting your friends over to watch the Super Bowl, although you may do that. But really, hospitality is extending to someone that I don't even know and showing them the love of Jesus Christ. Or maybe a new member. I mean, I was teasing the Parkers here uh, tonight because they came in and sat over here on this side. I said, did the rabbitoos offend you? And I said, uh, you went from the goats to the sheep. Or maybe it's the sheep to the goat. I don't know. I don't know. Anyways, but I do like the fact that sometimes they go to different spots so they can maybe meet different people. I'm just saying, let's do everything we can to show hospitality. That's what Gaius did. I'll expound upon those verses maybe next time. Let me ask you these questions. Number one, how healthy is your spiritual life? Is your soul prospering? Listen, I know a lot of people that physically they are healthy, but their soul is malnourished. Number two, are you walking in truth? Again, the greatest joy you can ever bring to my heart is to walk in truth. And the greatest sorrow you can ever bring to my heart is to get out of church and not walk in truth. Parents, Third question, parents, are you rejoicing over the right things in your kid's life? My kid made the honor roll. That's great. I think every kid needs encouraged. But the greater joy should be my kids walking in truth. My last question is, are you a hospitable person to both the brethren and to strangers? Old Gaius. The beloved brother, what an example he is to all of us. Father, we love you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for this man, Gaius. And thank you for inspiring this book, Third John, this postcard. Lord, I, I want to follow his example. Help my soul to prosper. Lord, help us every day to feast on the word of God. Help us to have soul prosperity. Help our souls to be as healthy as our bodies. Lord, I pray for every child, every teenager in this church that he or she would walk in truth. Lord, I have no greater joy. I pray for those who grew up here or children here and they're still walking in truth. Some as lay people, others 
in full-time Christian work. And I thank you, Lord, what joy that brings to my heart. And then, Lord, I think about other children that grew up here that are not walking in truth. Lord, I love them. And I pray wherever they are right now tonight, when they should be in church and they're not, Holy Spirit, please, please work in their hearts. Lord, help each one of us as parents to have the right priorities. And Lord, I know you don't call every boy to preach and every person to be a missionary. I think you're calling more than what are surrendering. But Lord, whatever you may call us to be or to do, a faithful man in our church or a missionary overseas, I pray, Lord, help us to walk in truth and help us as parents to rejoice in what causes your heart to rejoice. Lord, help us also to learn from Gaius to be hospitable. I pray to brethren and to visitors that we would extend a, a warm, friendly handshake in the love of Jesus Christ. So, Lord, please, we have a lot to learn from these verses. Please help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Thank you for listening so well. Are you spiritually healthy? Are you nourished in the Word of God every day? I think Paul told Timothy, nourished unto good works. We're nourishing our souls, and then from that we, we exercise unto good works. Are you hospitable to believers and to strangers alike? I could deal with those, but I want to come back to verse 4 for my question tonight. How many of you would say, Preacher, I know someone who's not walking in truth, and my heart's broken. In a minute when you pray, would you just collectively remember them in prayer? Maybe it's your child, maybe it's someone you know. But if that is you, would you raise your hand with mine tonight? Let's pray for them. And I know we're on different levels of walking in truth. Just because we're sitting in church on a Sunday night doesn't mean we're necessarily walking in truth. But may God help us to be faithful and steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, and faithful in our local church. Father, many hands were raised tonight. And we pray for every hand every individual that was represented by a raised hand. Lord, I pray, Spirit of God, tug, convict. Help those who are believing lies to start walking in truth again. We're asking, Lord, please work in those hearts. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand with our heads bowed, our eyes closed. Brother Rabideau is here <clears throat> at the front. If you're not sure you're saved or you have a need in your life, we'd love to help you from the Word of God. If you know of someone not walking in truth, why don't you come and pray for them tonight? Maybe parents, boy, this would be good. Why don't you come and pray, Lord, help my children to walk in truth. Not walk in worldly success. Walk in truth. And so I invite you parents to come. You that are under 21, why don't you come and pray, Lord, help me to stay on track and walk in truth and not get out of truth and not get out of church. As Mrs. Cook plays, we invite you to come. <clears throat> Maybe you have grandchildren that are not walking in truth. Maybe you can't kneel, but just like to come and sit on this pew and say, Lord, help them. Oh, God, help them to walk in truth. What a great verse to memorize. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth.
myself for thee. I own no master. My heart shall be thine own. My life I give henceforth to live for Christ alone. Well, amen. You may look this way. Maybe you could use this verse if you have a child or grandchild and just say, hey, pastor preached on this verse. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. You're walking in truth and you're blessing my heart and thank you. Or you're not walking in truth and I love you. And uh, I'm praying for you to walk in truth. Spirit of God, he'll lead you. If you're sensitive to what to maybe email or say or call or text or something like that. I'm just saying, I think that's a, that's a verse. Maybe we need to hang up on our house or, um, you know, have on our phone or somewhere as a constant reminder. That's a good prayer. Lord, help my children to walk in truth. And uh, been a great Lord's Day, hasn't it? Man, what a thrill to see God's house filled and God's people growing in the Lord. And uh, let's continue to be that way. Tuesday, of course, sea line visitation, and a Wednesday night back in the Lord's house. I think we have two slots open for the 30 days for prayer. And so if they have not gotten filled up yet, if you have not signed up, if you could sign up, uh, that would be great. And uh, we would appreciate that. And that I appreciate those already who have done that. We're right in the middle of that, starting that, and uh, that, that's, a, that's a blessing. Brother Todd Meister, would you lift up your voice and close us, my brother? Yes. Yes. Amen. God bless you. Love you. Have a good night.